Yeah, good morning, everyone. So today we're going to uh, carry on with our discussion of um, health services and why we're all here for. Um, today's talk is on need, demand, and use. Now, you may think you know all those three words really well. They're not hard, but then actually there's more to it than initial thought. Um, actually, we're all clinicians here, so actually it'd be really good to to get um, all your perspective at the end as well about the systems in Japan and where you know it, um, countries you know it. So just to outline where we've um, gone far through so far from the outline of the course, um, one of the structures we use in this course to lay out health services I mentioned um, on Wednesday, as we look at it from inputs, processes, and um, outcomes perspective. So it's a nice structure, and we've already world went through our way <laughs> through our inputs and we talked about formal and lay care, diseases and medical knowledge and um, healthcare professionals as well and um, also users of healthcare and the staff patient interaction and actually um, you know yesterday's seminar we had a little bit more deeper dive about healthcare professionals and the users of healthcare and you can see where it fits in in the sort of grander scheme of um, uh, of health services and delivering health services. Hopefully, we're barely beginning to build a picture already of you know, the micro, macro, uh, meso levels of how health services are organized and come to realize some of the complexities of it. You know, we, we, we see it now that it's come to be um, and, and what the challenges we're facing in trying to solve the many questions on quality, on if and the different dimensions of quality and we're looking at different aspects of a large puzzle and why it is it is the way it is hopefully we're now getting below the surface a little bit and we're getting a picture so today we're going to carry on with processes and looking at need demand and use so that's where we are okay so we're going to start off with a conceptual model and um, you know, I don't need to teach grandma, you all know what models are. Um, but basically, it's just for us to be mindful that um, it's a model. Um, what we're going to share you know, is what ta what's taught in the course, and what's in our, uh, in our textbook. Um, it is a simplification of the realities of the world. But we know that systems um, and organization of healthcare services is complex. And we do require a model to help us explain the complexities of the world. And we're always working with models um, in science and also in our daily lives. Like, for example, we we're, we're really familiar with geographical models like a map. If a map is a simplification of simplification of what the real world is, but you know, without a map, we wouldn't be able to even start understanding and navigating things. So this is similar, and a conceptual model, um, similar in, in a similar sense, it's helping us to think about processes. So this is a helpful one to look at need, demand, and use for health services. Like I said, you might know all these three words, but it's actually not as obvious as you think. Um, but it's also really crucial to lie to the heart of health services delivery, to understand uh, what each of these are, and also the interrelationship between these. So hopefully this morning together, I'll take you through an overview of um, how we can think about each of these and how we can think of it together and the model that relates it all. So I'm going to share with you two models this morning. Um, but the first one is this. Okay, we have a population and this is a group of people in a country um, and if you magnify it, is it could be you or me um, and so we are a population and it can, and if you look in the sort of more micro sense, one of those in the population becomes a patient, um, can be a patient, a member of the public. And at this point, suddenly you wake up this morning and you have a headache uh, because of the summer's heat, you feel headachey. And then at that point, you have moved from the population to a felt need arrow. You have a felt need. You aren't doing anything with your headache, you just feel like you have a headache. It's a subjective thing. You know, no one else knows about your headache and no one else can qualify it. It's just you. So at this point, it's a felt need. Then, 
you do one of two things really. He said, you might turn your felt need into a demand. This is where you go, oh, I think I should check this out. This is odd. I'm not used to having headaches first thing in the morning. And you will go to either your pharmacist or your doctor. <laughs> it might be one of those things. But those things, both of those, you would have moved yourself towards demand and that way. And you've turned your family into demand. Or you might be a stoic and think, I do not trust doctors. I do not trust painkillers. I don't want to do anything. I'm going to sleep it off. Um, and you'll just be, it will just have gone to the felt need. You will not have done anything with the need. And that would not be demand. So once you've turned, and this we call term illness behavior. And this, whether you do this or not, is purely uh, down to the patient, down to the public. Um, and it's a vital thing. We talked about lay care and formal care. It's a vital thing because this illness behavior drives that cross between uh, turning from lay care into formal care. So this is quite a crucial concept to remember. So felt need to demand. The next step is also very crucial. And that's called turning it from demand to normative need. And this is based on if you turn up to your doctor or your pharmacist um, and you say, I have a headache, doctor. The clinician can want to do, to do one of two things and say, yeah, I think we should check you out. You know, this is, you know, I'm going to look at your, do an optimal, you know, optimal scope and look at your fungi. And I think, oh, I'm not sure. Maybe we'll like scan your head and <laughs> something that we think it's serious here going, you know, not normal headache. Or I say, oh, you can sleep it off. It's nothing. It's, it's nothing serious. Don't worry. That's clinical judgment. And that can turn your need into a normative need, so a need for healthcare, objectively um, concluded by the doctor or the clinician to say, yes, you have a need for formal healthcare. That's not necessarily a doctor's, only a doctor's role. Uh, it could also be um, sometimes the pharmacist decides that, saying, well, yes, I'm going to give you a drug and you need this medication. Uh, take this and you'll be better. That's also a formal uh, normative need because a clinician has qualified your demand. Sometimes they will say, no, don't worry, take a rest, you'll be fine. And that will um, be a felt need. Now we might think this is clear cut because it's objective, but actually, you know, I will further explain, but actually it's not, it, it's, it varies. It varies, um, you know, sometimes it's very obvious. If you have a broken leg, hopefully 100% of doctors will see your x-ray and say, well, no, that needs fixing, let's reduce it or something. Um, or uh, it might be very subjective. Uh, it might be like, well, yeah, sleep it out and see, you know, two days later, if it's not better, come back. You know, it might be sometimes not obvious. So there's a degree of variation in clinical judgment as well. That's also crucial. Then afterwards, we have uh, a couple of things. Your need, so if the clinician has decided you have a normative need, there's one of two things that occurs. Your need is met immediately where the doctor treats you or the pharmacist gives you a prescription and you um, have your net need have been met, so you're in the most far right. Or there's a bit of, ra this is what we call rationing. It's impossible for all health systems and healthcare services to meet needs, all needs straight away. Um, and uh, for example, uh, waiting lists is a form. So you might, you might not be able to meet your need immediately. You still have a normative need. It's just not fixed immediately. It might be a bit of a wait. Uh, or yeah, you, you should have a hip replacement. It doesn't look very good. Uh, however, be on this waiting list. And this can be long or short. Sometimes it's not a waiting list. Some rationing happens um, in healthcare because of pay, your ability to pay. So yeah, you can have this treatment, but you can pay for it. And if you can't pay, also, you are you fall into category of unmet need. So that's rationing. Now, if you are in unmet need, one of two things can happen. Your need can be met at some point, time point in the future, or it can go back to a felt need. It can never be, it can probably never be met. And eventually, you know, your symptoms spontaneously resolve when you go back into the population and you don't no, no longer have a health need or a felt need. The last thing, uh, just to point out also 
that it's, it's possible that you are in a healthy population, and we are a school of public health, so we think about populations, without a felt need. And this is where screening comes in, where you didn't know you had a need, but you, but you actually have disease, and you screened it, did, and um, you know, health, health uh, prevention activities, you went for screening, and you detected some early cervical cancer, and so you suddenly have a disease, and it comes normatively, normatively straight away, without your realization of having a felt need. This is um, the model, hopefully, you know, is a way of us understanding you know, the way needs and demand come and use come together. There is another model, um, which is also quite helpful, and this is by an Australian GP, um, sometimes in the 60s, called the clinical iceberg. It's quite famous in other than when you probably have heard of it. Um, so what he kind of clearly you know, described is that there's only the top of the iceberg above the waterline, so, so, so to say, that you can see, which is demand for formal care. And that this iceberg gets bigger in the bottom. So majority of the population of us, hopefully, are healthy, and we have no need, demand, etc., for health care at all. And then, then there's this little chunk of a population where he called it unfelt need. So this is the people who would actually have disease, but you are not aware. So unless they went for screening, they wouldn't know. But then there's another chunk which we covered where there's felt need but no demand. So this is the person with a headache and haven't done anything about the headache. And then we've got demand for lay care, we talked about on Wednesday, where you seek some support and advice from friends and family, and then over the borderline formal care. So this is also quite a classic and useful model. But can you imagine, we talked about on, in, um, on Wednesday, that all that demand for lay care, if that shifted to formal care, how that might shift the waterline and how much more demand for health services that would create. And we talked about changes in lay provision of lay care as well um, as one of the challenges that we're facing today. 